For this week, we're going to be exploring the emergence of modernity and how that had effect on Christianity, uh, first in Europe and then flowing out from there in other parts of the world. So before we jump into that, it's worth spending a little bit of time on the definition of modernity. As we can tell, it um, comes out of this word modern, reflecting something about the modern era, but what are the conditions of the modern era or what are the conditions of modernity? So modernity emerges out of enlightenment thinking and in some ways it's useful to think of it as the next iteration of it um, as it emerges in the uh, late 18th and 19th century. So some of its uh, qualities are it emphasizes the importance of rationality that is the uh, desirability to apply reason to all things, but also rationality as a way of encountering the world itself. Alongside that, uh, a heavy emphasis on empiricism, that is what can be known and really what is worth knowing is what is observable. So we would track that alongside the rise of scientific thinking. And uh, an increasing skepticism about realms of the spiritual or the supernatural. And that's obviously going to have a significant effect on Christian life and practice. And then also uh, a critique of received norms, a way of interrogating, of employing what um, some call a hermeneutic of suspicion towards um, that which has been handed down. This can be applied to gender roles. It can be applied to systems of government. Uh, but we can also see how this is going to be applied in particular ways to the how the church accounts for itself and the question of to what degree does the church have a normative place in modern society. These are all dynamics that clearly come out of Enlightenment thinking, but are really being sharpened in the context of modernity. One of the other qualities of modernity is it tends to do things like create sharp distinctions between things and want to create hierarchies of um, knowledge and patternings and organizations. So we would then see a, a sharp distinction made in modernity between faith and reason. Whereas Anselm of Canterbury could describe his whole intellectual project, his whole theological agenda as faith seeking understanding, the thinking of modernity would want to separate the realms of faith from the realms of reason or intellection itself. So one to one, th th thus faith begins to move into the realm of the irrational or the um, unreflective would be a critique of modernity. Fact and value also become sharply uh, distinguished, that which can be known with certainty versus things that um, have more amorphous warrants for them of uh, value. The rational and the romantic are also distinguished here. And by romantic here, I don't mean um, the realms of affection and uh, relationships, but more how one encounters the world. So there can be a rational mode of encountering the world as a, a means of investigation and analysis. And there can be a romantic mode of encountering the world, especially the mode of encountering nature and encountering art. So you might be familiar with the romantic movements within poetry, literature, and the visual arts. Uh, the massive landscape paintings that emerged in this time period that show the human person dwarfed by nature all around is an expression of the romantic. And so transcendence gets pursued in the outside the realm of rationality and transcendence gets moved into the dimension of art. Another binary that emerges is the empirical versus the spiritual, which we've already hinted to previously here. 
There are things that can be ascertained and known, especially through the deployment of the sciences, the physical sciences that are emerging now. And then there are the realms of the spirit, which are held to be fundamentally unverifiable. And so if we think about this, Thomas Aquinas, when he begins his Summa Theologica, his, he opens with the question of whether theology is a science. And when he poses that question, he's posing the question of, is theology a system of knowledge? Is theology something that can be uh, systematically and fully reflected upon? And Aquinas, of course, assumes that supernatural categories like revelation will enter into play. But now in modernity, that which can be understood as science is broken away from the category of the spiritual or the supernatural, whereas Aquinas and many Christians up until the modern era thought those two hung together in some way. As I said, modernity works on creation, creating um, hierarchies of both knowledge, but also social organization. So one of the things we see that modernity do is, um, especially with it being a production of European culture, is it assumes that European cultural production, and in some ways Europeans themselves, stand at the pinnacle of uh human creativity and worth. And so uh, pseudo-scientific forms of racial classification emerge that try to presume that there are essential biologi biological markers of difference within human persons. And indeed, even those markers of biological difference carry some kind of moral weight to them as well. And so this is the creation of categories we've come to live with, like Caucasian, Asiatic, uh, as it's rendered in the 19th century, Negroid. These are all 19th century German creations uh, that in some ways are attempts to create a hierarchy of Europeans and uh, their descendants in various colonial zones like Canada or the United States or Australia that themselves, even though they claim to have a scientific foundation for them, we discover are really based on cultural assumptions that modernity itself is producing. And so racism, in some significant ways, is a production of modernity. And we'll be exploring this more as we go on. Another way in which we see productions of modernity is a clearer delineation of social classes or economic thinking or socialist Marxist analysis or development of the discipline of sociology. All are ways to reflect on these kind of uh, divisions that exist in human society, not just around race, but also around wealth and economic production. And again, there's a, a, a way to reflect on how modernity itself creates the class distinctions that it reflects upon. So now that we have a little bit of a definition of modernity established, let's think about what this does in a Christian context. And so what's significant here is that um, not just for Christians, but a whole range of people have to ask, how do we deal with modernity as it is developing? What modernity introduces broadly in many traditional cultures, uh, whether European or elsewhere, is a crisis of authority that's coupled with a notion of ideal progress. So as authority structures are being questioned and critiqued, this could be the monarchy, this could be Christianity, this could be all kinds of um, gender and family assumptions. There's a sense that progress is being achieved, but the stable base of society is shifting, or the authority centers of society are shifting. So there are several ways in which institutions and people tend to respond to modernity. One is to 
ignore or reject modernity. That is to look at what modernity offers and says, I want no piece of this. And so in this example, we could think of an example like the Eastern Orthodox Church, which to this day very much tries to resist incursions of modernity into its um, theology and practice. Another modality is to accept modernity or to adapt to modernity. That is to say, there, there are legitimate insights modernity has to offer to us. We're going to engage with these insights and we're going to actually adapt parts of our social structures uh, to it. We could see this playing out um, significantly in the establishment of the Episcopal Church, which really um, embraces some of the markers of, a, of modernity, like democratic representative forms of government, or um, fairly easily uh, absorbs uh, new modes of reading scripture that take into account critiques of modernity, such as the ability to accept um, evolutionary theory as congruous with a doctrine of a God who creates all things. A third mode would be a, uh, a critique of modernity, a real uh, engagement with the arguments of modernity, and then a uh, not simply a rejection of it, but the offering of an alternative structure to it. And we're going to see that play out within Roman Catholicism with the First Vatican Council and its articulations of uh, critiques of modernity and in particular the way in which it develops notions of papal infallibility as a critique of modernity. And then finally we can see an inversion of modernity. That is a way in which it seems as if that categories and challenges of modernity are being rejected, but actually many of the deeper thought patterns of modernity um, get internalized into the system. And so one place where we can see this playing out in very interesting ways is with the development of Protestant fundamentalism, which we'll be covering uh, in our uh, sessions uh, in the future. Fundamentalism in some ways both claims to reject certain key elements of modernity, but then also enacts very modern ways of approaching um, the, the biblical text. So those are some um, broad categories to keep in mind. Um, I'm spending some time here on modernity because modernity still continues to affect Christianity. We might be moving out of the era of modernity and into what people have called post-modernity. But even that suggests an ongoing form of response to the multiple ways that modernity has had effects on society in the United States and globally. Okay, I hope that is all helpful for now. In our next video, we're going to look at some ways that Protestantism engaged with modernity.